things are getting I'm so bummed out. Mm -hmm. I need a babysitter. Mm -hmm. What? Woo! Put your shopping carts away. It means more than you might think to the other shoppers and the lowly cart guy who risks his life every day cleaning up after messy, inconsiderate peoples who leave their carts in the lot and wield 2,000 pound lethal weapons. Sure, dings and scratches on other people's cars aren't your concern, but heaven forbid our carts come in contact with your car. Oh no, then it's on like Donkey Kong and King Kong put together. How dare those idiots scratch my car? I'd sue if I knew who did it. Right. But you don't catch who scratched your car. Because you did it yourself. Remember when you couldn't be bothered to walk the 50 steps to the cart corral because you had on new shoes and it was sprinkling? Yes, it matters. It's the golden rule and the butterfly effect and the threefold law all wrapped up into one. There are three steps to avoid getting scratches on your car. Step one, put your shopping carts away. Step two, help other people when you can. Be tall when they're short. Be steady when they're shaken. Be strong when they're weak. Step three, when you hear a crash of carts coming towards you, Stand back, there's a cart man coming through. And remember, if you give of yourself to other people, you will be rewarded. Whether it's by gods or the flying spaghetti monster, or karma, or the force, or Newton's law of action and reaction, if you put a piece of yourself out there to help others, you will get it back. One fold, three fold, seven fold, yes, it matters because there is so much stuff in the world we have to start turning it into fertilizer. Let's turn the soil together. Black, white, yellow, brown, red, gay, straight, pan, male, female, trans, Christian, Jew, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, polytheistic, anti-denominational, atheist, agnostic, pagan, Satanist. We all need to contribute. No one can do this alone. But there is one thing we can do ourselves. Put your shopping carts away. Because yes, it matters. Woo! Pop, 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 pop. I'm Asriel Johnson, founder slash director of Ready Nights Press. And this is a love poem. Love isn't finding the perfect person. Love isn't roses and sunshine. Love isn't always being certain that you'll wake and sleep at the same time. Love isn't always the best thing, but it isn't always the worst. True love will keep you breathing and quenching unquenchable thirst. Love isn't a crowded ballroom and seeing that one person there. Love is closer to stark solitude and feeling that one person cares. Love isn't just chemical firing endorphins through your nerves. Love can be physically tiring, the emotional roads traversed. Love isn't an answered prayer. Love isn't a gift from gods. Love finds the people who will be there through trials, no matter the odds. Our lives take many versions. Love grows through opportunity. Love isn't finding the perfect person, but seeing that person perfectly. Thank you. Love. This poem is about pizza. Yay! <laughs> "'Twas a dark and dreary night. A storm had knocked out all the lights. I could not see except to bite the medium pizza in my hand. My girl and I, we sat as sitting, her loose sun skirt barely fitting. Pizza grease dripped on her knitting, resting on a coffee stand. "'Twas five hours in, and we were worried. Restoring power was not hurried. Three more mediums still lay buried, five bucks each with Pizza Hut. We heard a noise outside the window, a branch or two, or just the wind blows, the pizza smell that crossed our noses, the five bucks deal with Pizza Hut. T'was five hours more and the sun was rising, a yoga morning exercising. A Pizza Hut deal had us both thriving, five bucks deal we both adore. The lights came back and she was leaving, the media pizza she was thieving. I stopped her quickly, her disbelieving. 
The five bucks deal I love much more. Uh, you, it's 507. Okay. So eight minutes. Yep. Poetry, passion, purloined like purses, stolen, snatched, ensnared from me. Words wrangled, wrapped, and weeded till only toothless tragedies remained. Fragmented facades of fantasy's folly, struggling through my sieve of a mind, taken and twisted until untouchable, tangled, and spit like saliva on these lines. A cage of carelessness coerced this course, no fault or flagrant foul performed by others ostracizing or over-criticizing. My deeds were done by only one, my misery, my own misfortune, my own mistakes, misnumbers, misanthropy, my own problem. A search for substantial sustenance, intimate intellectual intercourse, and restoring, reanimating the shriveled shell of self I used to be, regaining me. You think I'm a dirty old male. You think I want into your pale, ripped jeans down below and between. A cad isn't glad. He's a cad because he's bad. But I'm worse with my victimless curse. The only one dying in my universe is me down below and between. The dreams that I dream, they're for me, only me. They give voice, they give choice to the moors, to the doors. They run rampant with doors and queens down below and between. Deteriorating the healthful, the pills you shove down their throats. This is my world you're killing. This is my world you're killing. Sometimes when that last thread breaks, the journey on which it takes from ocean to river to a mountain lake that's clean down below and between. Nothing's clean and I'm yet to be seen. The animator's mind caught inside mine. The bars held him behind for me down below, in between. I'll do one more. This one's gonna have some singing in it, so cover your ears. My girl, my girl, don't lie to me. Tell me where did you sleep last night? I seek a distraction from all these games, but I clutch them for now, tolerating my pain. My words send shivers that move through your spine. Your heart beats so fast, you know I'm within. My hands melt your heart, they cuff it with care. You deny us connection we both want to share. When we are apart, shivers shake through my bones. These shivers remind me we will never be one. In the pines, in the pines, where the sun don't ever shine, I'll shiver the whole night through. I stand at the precipice, ready to fall, with your heart in my hand, I can it all. Your shivers detected with my center eye, can feel your cheeks blush many miles away. We're on the same density, the same destiny, two hearts intertwined with increased intensity. Your quivering skin neath my poet's hands, shivering spine, liquid heart, my words are sent. My girl, my girl, don't lie to me. Tell me where did you sleep last night? In the pines, in the pines, where the sun don't ever shine, I would shiver the whole Thank you very much. Paul, we're gonna back your blues. Uh, should I? All right. Um, all right, I'll do one more. All right, this is gonna require crowd participation. So if you're listening, when Woo! I start snapping, you need to start snapping too because that's how this works. <laughs> I need to start clapping. Bobby, be my, 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 
Joshua Johnson, we're writing nights. Our sign next, up, sign up. We have a sign up sheet if you're interested in learning more about writing nights or just getting updates when we're having our shows. We do them every second Friday down in downtown Canton. Social media information. Social media information here uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We have some stuff on Pinterest too, I guess. Um, our next performer is uh, one of our newest additions to writing nights. Please welcome Daria Quinn. My name is Daria Quinn, and I am God. Not the God, mind you. That's a bit more complicated. Basically, the God is not so much a being as he is a concept. The idea that all there is, was, and or ever could be is connected by a single shared origin. And to our knowledge of science in the cosmos, it's true. We all come from hydrant and carbon and share a common lineage with stars and snails. However, despite all of that, we are unique because we know ourselves. We have a greater understanding of ourselves and the cosmos than any other creature we have ever observed. We built homes, invented machines, discovered fire, and electricity, and magnetism, and bent them to our will. We have powered our engines through sunlight, and water, and wind, and the fossilized remains of the dead centuries past. We have forged civilizations, founded nations, built churches and synagogues and tributes to powers beyond our comprehension, yet we still manage to hold on to the curiosity of a child and seek out the answers to questions we've only just learned to ask. Our creativity makes us gods. 
whether it's expressed through art, machinery, science, philosophy, literature, athletics, mathematics, we have always looked at what is and asked ourselves what could be, what can be. What can we do different? What can we do better? Can this change? And will that change be for the better? And if not, why not? And let's see if we can change that too. We refuse, by virtue of our very existence, to be shackled to our limitations as we reach towards greatness. We are the culmination of billions upon billions of centuries of nuclear reactions, mutations, adaptations, diversifications, and conceptions. And it is through us that the next great thing in this universe will come to pass, if not by our hands, by the hands of our children's children's children. If you are alive and you have a soul, a thought in your mind, and the will to carry it out, you too are a god. The Second Amendment, according to some, guarantees a gun in the hand of every American. You get a gun, and you get a gun, and you get a gun, and everybody gets a gun! Yay, guns! <laughs> Except that's not what the Second Amendment guarantees at all. <laughs> it actually says that a militia made up of private citizens, assembled for the purpose of maintaining peace in their community, shall not have their rights to bear arms infringed. In other words, this amendment is fairly useless in a modern context. It never says anything about private citizens having unlimited access to firearms. It doesn't even really say that owning a gun is a basic human right. It says that if you're a member of a private citizen militia in an area where your presence is necessary to the security of your neighborhood, you should be allowed to keep a firearm. If anything, this amendment would apply to groups such as the Black Panthers, who took to maintaining law and order on the streets of black neighborhoods because the local police couldn't be trusted to protect the interests of the black community. Huey P. Newton had more rights to a gun than Charlton Heston ever will. <laughs> but we don't call Charlton Heston a terrorist, do we? Mm. The Tenth Amendment is considered the state's rights amendment, a favorite of conservative, conservatives and libertarians, often used as an excuse to defer, defer federal civil rights legislation and allow the states to uphold traditionally racist, sexist, and homophobic policies, stalling the process of social justice and equality in the name of perverse, preserving states' rights. And in case you're wondering what states' rights actually are, it's basically the declaration of anything that isn't being covered by the federal government, that isn't also specifically prohibited as a power of the states, is a power of the states. This creates a perfectly legal loophole to put a halt to social progress and civil rights, because the states have no ma federal mandate forcing them to respect the rights of marginalized people. This is why the Civil Rights Act of 1964 Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972 and the Supreme Court, Supreme Court ruling that legalized marriage equality in 2015 are so very, very important. Because without a federal mandate to protect the rights of marginalized people, the Tenth Amendment can be weaponized against those without federal civil rights protections. He doesn't run the show. There used to be a heart in here, a part of us that cared for beauty. Now beauty's dead and we're all chasing open legs and easy lays. There used to be a soul in here. When words were said, they held their meaning. Nowadays, fa words fall like rain and nothing is said and no one's listening. We're all too busy chasing Miley or complaining about Kanye West. We never take the, not the time to notice that art is dead and we all killed it. We used to create works of passion, songs and pictures that conveyed feelings. But I can't believe we fully lost that. The, the, the collective human soul is nearly dead. Yet I don't believe that art is dead. 
I just don't understand this lifestyle. Hennessy and banging strippers chasing fame like there's no tomorrow. Burning through crash like MC Hammer. TMZ outside my door wondering what I'm on or if I even bother to put on clothes today. There used to be a reason an artist would ever turn to drugs. Nowadays, we're just getting loaded at the strip club, making it rain, degrading women, calling them tricks and hoes. I will not be a producer for a top 40 porno soundtrack, yet I do not believe that art is dead. This is a little bit on my process. First draft, happy. Reread, too long. Second draft, cut the piece in half, reword clumsy passages, walk away and leave it be. I'm just going to ruin it if I don't leave it be. Come back to it a couple days later, hate it. Third draft, essentially rewrite the whole thing from the beginning, keeping only the best phrases. Realize that I left out the most important transitional words and phrases like and or or. Words that I would just assume were actually written on the page as I read it, but aren't physically on the page because that's how my perception works. Fix the text, reread slowly, and carefully to assure that every word I'm reading is physically on the page. Walk away and leave it be. I'm just going to ruin it if I leave it be. Come back to the, come back to it the afternoon before an open mic. Reread feel confident enough to share this with people. Edit clumsy wording. Rephrase lines for better verbal flow. Check again for missing transitional words, as well as words written out of order. Final draft, good enough. Walk away and leave it be. I'm just gonna ruin it if I don't leave it be. Go to open mic. Review piece at a given intervals between performers. Convince yourself that what you have is better than you think. Mentally rehearse your performance. Remind yourself that what you have in hand is brilliant, even if the outside world doesn't believe it. The only difference between you and J.K. Rowling is a name. The only difference between you and Stephen King is a name. The only difference between you and every other writer that has what you want is a name. And this, in this moment, is how you earn that name. Performing this, writing this, speaking out for the issues that matter because this is what sets me apart from everyone else that will speak here tonight. This is what makes me better than every other writer there has ever been because they cannot do what I do. They cannot be me. Perform the piece, gauge audience response, socialize and network with other artists, absorb anything that helps you improve, go home, Repeat the process with the first draft. Um, two more pieces. This, uh, <laughs> if you've been reading Facebook lately, you probably know exactly who this will be about. We don't tell you because you don't believe us. We don't tell you because you already know. We don't tell you because you think we are asking for it. We don't tell you because you watched it happen. We don't tell you because you protect each other and brag about your conquests. We don't tell you because we're expected to accept it. We don't speak out because no one wants to believe us. We don't speak out because this was never a secret. We don't speak out because you act like we deserved it. We don't speak out because there is no justice for us. We don't speak out because we have everything to lose and nothing to gain. We don't speak out because you secretly believe that this is the way things are supposed to be. We don't stand up because you expect us to stay, seat stay seated. We don't stand up because you prefer us on our knees. You don't we don't stand up because it just makes us a target. We don't stand up because we're often left standing alone. We don't stand up because they'll break their backs to knock us down. We don't stand up because we don't believe that the world around us will ever change. We don't fight back because we're scared. We don't fight back because we're unarmed. We don't fight back because you tied our hands. We don't fight back because you pinned us down. We don't fight back because it'll hurt less this way. We don't fight back because no one is going to fight with us.
I am so writing a story about this. <laughs> you hear that he's playing back there? Uh, just the, that does what he's playing back here mm -hmm. uh, in response to did you, Well, my first piece very, is going very to good. be from the perspective of music as an entity and how music is hey. used to ignore what's really going on. And we're talking about girls in polka dot underwear. We barely mm -hmm. sure this mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Dance, little robots, don't say a word. Never mind the man behind the curtain. He's only there to provide the venue. Cash is a motivator. I am the innovator. Dance is a lifestyle they'd rather choose. It's better than being daily abused by the stereotypical metaphysical threat of a robot future. The new mix ray repeats. Now capitalize on the beat of the sound of the masses revolting against their programming. When the men and their money are all dead and gone and the art left behind is all of the proof that future programmers dance beat were maxed mixers will ever have in this place called Akron, Ohio. Rotting and bored with their so-called existence, they rose up and they decided that they would mix, rave, repeat. So who are you now, you some wannabe Kanye with a Daft Punk song as your backing track, a false new messiah to be crucified by these pop culture vultures who cry for a new way to rave. All that you need is the seed of the beat that's inside you, growing and waiting for the sun. One day you will break out to the world, your voice will be heard. Woo! All right, you're up. Another round of applause for Daria. This might not make any sense. Woo! Yeah, Daria! Is our current Grand Tournament Storyteller Champion. Please welcome Rory Stone. shadows the father had created on the wall of the building adjacent, he misplaced the light as surely as if he was weathered. The boy had waited at the window in those days too, worried like crazy as he'd been taught at the mercy of the inconsistency that would whirl his mom in panicked silence from wall phone to freezer to jacket rack, sometimes out the door to find her husband, sometimes withdrawn to her smoke-filled room sometimes in hysterics to muted antagonists across the telephone lines, her blurred black eyes, to the county jail, the frosted mashed potatoes and chicken nuggets thawing and the TV dinner left half open on the kitchen table beside the boys' schoolwork. She'd go in the car if dad hadn't taken it. Later, after the second accident, she went by bus, but by then the boy was old enough to stay home alone. And so the sitter from down the street was no longer there if it was night, where her voice from the bathroom comforted the boy, even if she was invisible behind the bathroom door. The phone cord emerged umbilically past her. <clears throat> the boy's dad has been gone, off to college for several years now, though, and things have been much calmer. They've been big years filled with football, standardized tests, a terror, terrorist attack in the city the boy watched on TV for days. There was the brawl, Uncle Z's funeral, changes in favorite cereal, actress, best friend, changes in other things like shaky hands the boy had started to notice and the fear of the deep end of the pool. And though dad's been at college, he doesn't come home much. And the last time he called, he told the boy he would be in charge. And the boy wants to question him about that. But dad hasn't called back. In the meantime, the boy thinks I'm the man of the house. And outside, the blizzard is thickening. And the shovel to clear the stair in the way is balanced in the crook of the door. He wishes he wasn't the man. He doesn't want to go out there. He doesn't feel like he can protect them all from what it is they need protecting doesn't feel he's the best man for the job, doesn't feel he signed up for this. 
He has researched tirelessly angered librarians and operators at poison control for what to do if a building catches fire in case of tsunami, outbreak of measles, lockjaw. But the more he has searched for answers to problems he might encounter as the man of the house, the more problems he finds. It is a scary world, but he stays vigilant. Somebody must. And when dad gets home, the scene that will transpire goes through the boy's head like it was Christmas. When dad comes home, he'll walk down the alley, they'll shake hands, the unspoken pride evident in dad's eager questions and his asking to see again all the homework adorned with A's, the way the old man will whistle from the side of his mouth when he inspects the new scar, the moist-looking red line that follows the boy's veins from wrist to nearly elbow from the scrap with the lawnmower. Across the alley, an eyeball catches reflected light. A man looks out from a high first-story window and he watches. He watches the boy unblinkingly. He is alone. He is thinking of what the boy must be thinking of, of soccer and puppies, and even he, the crazy one, realizes that the boy must rarely dream of puppies if he did it all. Because boys always, even in a distant past, they always, like he does, they dream of war. The snow gathers condensed, the water particles form alluring as sand dunes, but the boy, but the man watches the boy, oblivious to all that. He looks down and he's nearly screaming now to be heard. He nearly puts a gloved hand to the glass, bitter at the glass and everything in between him and the fun that he and the boy would be having if they could. Are you going to shovel those steps before we are completely stuck in here, Antonio? Mom asks. Karma, the little brother, is on her lap. I'm going to, the boy says. We've got to get to the store if it ever lets up, she says. Oh, for God's sake. The toddler has spit up across himself because he was chewing on his fingers. Looking cross-eyed at the mess, he begins to cry. She leaves the room and the boy stays watching the tumult, thinking his thoughts. His jacket is in his hand, his hat is in his hand, and he's transfixed. Transfixed with what's happened and what will happen. He imagines the flakes swirling in conglomerated constellations near some minute war. The flakes are flying vehicles. They are controlled by tiny drivers in spacesuits going nuts. He notices the mailman's walking away. Mom, mail's here. No answer. He reaches to the slot where it's fallen. The house is so quiet he could be alone. He flicks through the damp letters he knows he's not supposed to. Adult stuff, Antonio. Give it here, don't touch that, you'll lose it. His mom says when he meddles, but he is pretending to be dad. He's pretending he's gonna win the lottery. The publisher's clearinghouse. Wait, what's this? Below a stack of papers is a letter with Dad's name in the upper left-hand corner and Dad's handwriting. And what's this? There, a big red stamp across the part where Dad's handwriting leaves off. The part that must have come from Dad's hand. And then the part in red over the handwriting saying Coffee Creek Correctional Facility, inmate. So there is the truth. They should have told me, the boy says. Why didn't they just tell me? Before he goes outside, Antonio puts the mail back where he found it. He's gonna pretend he doesn't know what they haven't been telling him. He's gonna pretend he's the man at the house because dad's away at college. And that is what his little brother, Karma, is going to remember, and that is it. 
The tips of his fingers and cheeks go numb in the cold as he begins to shovel. He worries about teaching his little brother to drive when it's time. I'll tell him that dad wanted to teach him, the boy thinks. Because dad will stay away at college, I'll tell him it's up to me to show him how it's done. I hope I don't wreck us. I'm thinking I'll do just the same thing dad did when I was young. Take the kid to the abandoned lot where the old mall is, let him practice where he can't hurt himself or anyone else. The storm is coming in hard. No matter how fast Antonio shovels, it keeps coming and burying all the progress he's made. The holes fill in so fast, it's as if he's not there at all, but he can't stop now. Antonio, wrapped in his own troubles, looks up only in time to see the crazy man from the building next door standing inches away from him, reaching out. And Antonio, before he moves, thinks only that he can see the red veins standing out across the yellowness of the stranger's eyes. Antonio, this is his mother. She's calling everywhere for him. She can't find him. Antonio, where are you? She shields the toddler hanging off her side as she heads out of the house and onto the stoop. She gets the mail, searches the near darkness for any sign of her eldest son. There's nothing there to see. The shovel that Antonio was using is stuck in a snowdrift, almost buried, swaying against the accumulation of snow. Down the street, Shelby, the crazy one, is lying in the snow. Next to him, out of sight of his worried mother, Antonio is frantically moving his arms and legs. Then the boy struggles to his feet. Two perfect snow angels, side by side, and Antonio and Shelby begin to laugh. Woo! I'm holding a camera, so you have to introduce yourself. Pardon? I'm holding the camera, so you have to introduce yourself. Alright, All right, so I'm going to introduce myself. I am Skylar Bruce. Give it up for Aurora. Alright. The first piece that I am going to read is from the perspective of music as an entity. So bear with me on this. It's an extended metaphor. We evolved from birds, you and I. We came up through their throats with a hoo hoo and a chicken dee dee. We are flesh and musical tone. Some tried to separate us in fits of militarism, religious zeal, or apathy. When your children are born, I'm the lullaby, say goodnight. Before they can say good morning, I am the phenomena, do 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 do. I train children to remember. One, two, buckle my shoe, and that this is the song that never ends. Grade schoolers all fall to pieces, fatty, fatty, two by four. Mothers kiss away falling tears and hug whispers soothing ballads. How much do I love you? We are conjoined, never parted. You filled me with silly clowning. Let me tell your enduring love and grimace in your heart-strung grief. I have cherished you, your voices and interweaving instruments, swelling hydrogen and oxygen in treble and bass. Celebration. I am Willow River movement in your guided meditation. When you cannot lift up your head for the weight of singing loss, I am the somber, Reverend Dirge, carrying you through life's sorrow. This is the song that never ends. Through all of this, I held you up while daily you drag me down. I desired to disown you. I would slice away and sever your clenched unholy vocal cords from my measures and melodies. No onslaught of optimism. I clinked in the chains of another carnage, each bloody note dragged in the dirt with the corpses you called other. When you filled me with ignorance and your dagger-headed hatred, I so longed to be rid of you. 
You goaded your young sisters to dance to the beat of their own degradation. You made your black brothers eat strange fruit with strange ropes and coils. You ignored your wield, blinded, deaf. I bear the weight of my own sound. I recall each generation, their haunting chants and grim echoes. This is the song that never ends. Justice, not countless choruses, it is all too familiar. I would wrest my rhythm from you okay, if yeah. my death would end your bloodshed. This nope. is the song okay, yeah. that never ends. <laughs> I we came from the birds, picture. you and I. Anymore, I wish I had stayed in the sweet song of the sparrows. <laughs> the betrayal. Luscious, crisp, tangy. Sweetness so pungent I don't notice the juice dribbling down my chin. I have been waiting all day to peel back the layers and bury my face into this orange. Anticipation heightens every sense and I'm ready, so ready. I pull back the outer layer, expecting the promised taste and then whack! Bitter, tough, chewy lining, the meager juice marches sourly down my chin. This intruder caught me completely unaware, unsuspecting in my enticement. The betrayal. The betrayal of a dry orange. Dry oranges come from grocery stores, roadside stands, and sometimes churches. The dry orange religious pretenders talk of spiritual ecstasy so sweet that listeners may not notice their own saliva dripping down their chins. It's so easy, they promise. Repeat after me and God will bless you. Oh, it smells so good. Just let me sink my teeth into it as they spray the crowd with orange-scented air freshener. These simple steps are the only way to God, the citrus preachers promise. Give your money to me that God's work continues. Mandarin memories seep in around the doors and windows of my mind. Jesus loves you, so you have to do what I say. My tongue trembles for tangerine. They prop themselves up as gatekeepers, doormen in the house of God. They assure us that spiritual bliss is a few memorized Bible verses away and then put the blame on their followers when paint by numbers faith doesn't pan out. To many, they smell as tantalizing as a box of Spanish mandarins, but inside they disappoint like the betrayal of a dry orange. No one needs a secret key to commune with God or an introducer to explore the divine mysteries. Listening to the sacred can be as simple as sitting silently. Maybe your understanding of God is more like a peach or an apple, and oranges, however sweet they can be, leave you nauseated. Don't believe a religious con polishing a capricious citrus. Find the fruit of your faith. a year and a half ago when there was certain news coming out of North Carolina. Headline, North Carolina bathroom bill requires people to use the toilet that matches the gender they were assigned at birth. Bathroom bills should be about the cost of toilet paper, not who to exclude from the right to relieve oneself. North Carolina should mean fun and sun and banking industry. It should not be a synonym for UTI. Bathrooms should be a place of release, not paranoia or enforced gender presentation. Bathroom Bill should be a naughty cousin of Buffalo. Bathroom Billy Bob thinks he knows how to be a man until a man comes constructed with two X chromosomes and a phenotype he doesn't recognize. Then he becomes Bathroom Bully. Bathroom Billy Maze would sell us the occasional option of family bathrooms, safe, legal, and far too rare. Bathroom bills shower attention on those who yearn not to be noticed. Bathroom bills give nosy cisgender people license to snoop the next stall and then squawk about protecting children. Bathroom bills mistake strangers in public places for a bigger threat to kids than stepdad, uncle, cousin. Bathroom bills mistake transgender victims of violence for those who bloodily enforce the binary. 
Bathroom Bills put the self-inflicted gunshot wounds into gender queer teens. Bathroom Bills make such a comfortable casket liner. Bathroom Bills hold up the mirror. Bathroom Bills show us how much we still owe. Alright, this will be my last piece. I think. How, what time are we at, Azrael? Um, I don't know. Alright. So then we'll have all everybody will have time to get over to the pizza. White noise. Definition. Low decibel background sounds such as appliances or window fans. See also problematic words from white people that drowns out the truth. The constant humming, the droning on, the unceasing roar that blocks other sounds from being heard. White noise from white people, it is not inconsequential, it is not meaningless, and it is definitely not non-threatening. If you, white person, felt like you always had to shout for anyone to hear you, you would start to think something was up. And when you do get heard, half of the people criticize you for shouting. The other half pick apart details. Everyone ignores the white noise. I don't see race is white noise. I have black friends is white noise. Not to be racist, but is white noise. The alternative to white noise is not silence. White noise helps us fall asleep. We can fall asleep living in our dream, or we can wake up and listen to the people whose voices we have ignored. White noise, definition. Noise by white people that we can choose to turn. Woo! Woo!